Yes. Wherever you are, then we can be able to pray. Let's pray. Holy <coughs> Father in heaven, I am so thankful for bringing us together. You know something about this thing that affects our life here below and in the world to come. So help us, Lord, that we may understand your word and leave that word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. That is uh, so special. Um, marriage just its two sides. It can either bring life, I mean, um, uh, bring blessing. to your life, or it can, well, that's possible, depending on preparation before marriage is the most important thing. And yet, how often that these subjects are left unstudied and untaught in our churches. So we are living in a time when actually a lot of idle talking is going on when the things that are affecting the spirituality of the young and the old are blanketed and not spoken about. There's a lot of talk about doctrines and that's all right. But I'll say that actually many of us are not suffering what we call doctrinal uh, uh, poison, but they are suffering moral poison, all right? So we are talking about something that is a problem not only among us non-believers, because when we are talking about marriage, many people think that it's a problem to only non-believers or to heathens. And yet I can state without mincing my words that when I was in college, I realized that marital issues, moral issues were a bigger issue amongst those who subscribe to the church than those who never subscribe to the church. There were serious heartbreaks in the church that I could hear from outside. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Now let me begin by a story that I have told some of you of uh, some of the things that we might take lightly, but I'll repeat this again because Repetition deepens impression, and I am praying that God will put words into my mouth. So I am in this meeting, and I have uh, preached and preached and preached and preached and taught, and I'm sitting down in the office, and I am receiving guests and talking to them, and this young lady comes into the office. And I welcome her in. She's a young lady. Uh, she looks like an Adventist. She looks like a vegetarian. She looks like, yeah, she's someone who has done some good air reform. You understand what I'm talking about? And she tells me that I have a problem. And the problem is A, B, C, and D. I got into marriage and I think that this marriage that I got into was an Adventist marriage. Why do you think it was Adventist? I think it was Adventist brother Zadok because the person who exchanged vows with me is ideally a youth leader. And this person is not only a youth leader, but after marrying me is as good as a youth elder. He is respected. He preaches in the church. He drives a good vehicle. He's a nice man. And this is just a one among the many stories I've received. I was sharing with him when an old man woke me up at night when I went to preach somewhere. And he told me, young man, I know you're young, but I remember that Timothy was told by Paul that I charge thee, therefore. You are young, but I do what? I charge thee. Put everything in order in this church, isn't it? Timothy was basically a young man. I think that's why the old man was speaking to me. And the old man told me a lot of stories about his marriage and was asking me to come and help. I've received a number of these calls, not as many as many people have received, 
but this one will touch the youth because I know they form a majority of those who are listening to me today. And this lady tells me, this was a good gentleman. He calls himself Amtumishi. Um, I think from that day, all of you know, I don't like the name Tumishi. You know, I don't like it, isn't it? Those of you who are told, don't call me Amtumishi. Um, because even Ellen White say, don't call me a prophet because that name has been done what? Abused, you understand? That phrase had been abused. We are living in a time that anyone, even a comedian, will use the phrase to me. You understand? Now I know why I use that name. So give me a, something, a better, a better title, all right? Yeah, uh, just call me the child of God. Just call me brother. Just call me brother Zadok. That, that's good enough for me, or a missionary. I'm glad for that. But then she told me them to me. Who married her? The legal husband shouted at her on the first day of marriage. That is about four hours after the exchange of vows. What happened? What happened? I'm not talking about any ordinary person in the world. I'm not talking about something I watched in the movie. I'm not talking about something that, I'm talking about a real life story. Something that almost made me shed tears, why? While they were going for breakfast, the man shouted, called her, shouted at her again in the hotel. And by the time they were going to have, they were going to have their honeymoon, that three nights later, the man beat her. That's a preacher. So I'm not talking about some people who are not, who are not in the truth, all right? So when I'm thinking about marriage and the mysteries that in them, I am thinking about if these signs were shown before, but when I tried to interrogate her, she told me, you know what, child of God, I remember one day I had an experience like that, but I didn't take it serious. Because I remember my boyfriend coming from, I think somewhere to meet me, I was from a long trip, and then you were meeting by the road and he shouted at me, but I didn't take it as a really, as something huge. You know, I said, is um, to me. So I'm sure he will change. He loves the Lord. And if the pastor preaches to him, he will change. He loves the Bible. And he didn't take that seriously. You know, yesterday I was telling you, if your boyfriend tells you I'll beat you, be careful. He's going to beat you. He's going to beat you. It's not a joke. Is going to execute it because the more he speaks that word, the more it is impressed in the mind and the more it is converted into action. All right? And let me talk to young people before I go deep. You must make decisions about what you are going to do in your marriage before you get married. You must know what you are going to do when your wife offends you. Are you going to keep quiet? Are you going to pray about it? Are you going to run? Are you going to report to your mother? Are you going to call your, your, your best and man and best lady? You must choose what you are going to do, including when you find your wife with another man on your matrimonial bed. What are you going to do? You must think about it. There are decisions you must make so that when you come to that point, should such a thing happen, you are going to be like, I had promised that I'll do this. And I'm going to live by that principle. I had promised I'll never lay my hand on my wife. Yes, it's nasty, the talk is so bad, I don't like it, it's disrespectful, but I would rather walk out of this house now and come back more sober. I'm not going to lay my wife hands on this woman. Then am I going to talk in a way that is unchrist -like? Because you make that decision before. The problem is people don't know what they are going to do when the crisis comes. And it's because we enter into this thing that you call dating, which we understood yesterday to be kind of something so random, rather than into the heavenly courtship that is not random, but what was courtship like? Deliberate, isn't it? So the sister told me he beat me. He broke my phone. And finally, the sister asked in a honeymoon, give me money 
presents which you are given at the wedding. I just need my fair back home. That's all I need from you. But he was not willing to. The lady had trusted him. He had taken all the men into his pockets. You know, you trust your husband, no? Yeah, you know, my embezzler uh, pin is this, and you know, my card pin is this, and everything. And then things turn all the way around. Right? Then she wants to go back home. She doesn't have anything, and she can't call. So what happens? A few days, a few months, the man beat the woman again. And the man tells the woman, let's do devotion from the book of Matthew. Love them that do what? Hit. And they go to church. The woman is having a lot of crumbs. The husband is the one going to preach. He doesn't know. The woman is suffering to get help. She goes out of the church. She sleeps under the tree. The husband doesn't know. He's trumpeting from the pulpit in a suit with a tie. And the church is being convicted to make decisions when he doesn't have a church at home. That's marriage. So if youths, you ever looked at marriage as something that is so decked with some glass roast, I mean, uh, you understand what I'm talking about? you got to know that there is something that many people have not been told. And if you are minister so that people can confide in you and share with you their stories, you'd be like, God, what's happening in this world? It's happened. And if every one of us was to open their stories, you'd be like, you know what? Stop it there. We've had enough. All right? We've had enough. There are a lot of things, and you know why this is really happening? It's because we are all looking in the wrong direction. One, for satisfaction, love satisfaction. We are all looking in the wrong direction. We have had a wrong voice, and we are looking in a wrong direction for solutions. All right? Where really do we get uh, solutions to our marriage? Who really is counseling us? I know ladies who have this volume of novels that they're reading about how to form families, isn't it? And I know people who have watched soap opera so much so that all they want is some Alejandro from some. You understand what I'm talking about now? Yeah, someone with a fleet of vehicles who jumps from this chopper to this sports car to this and takes them out and all these things. It's crazy, all right? You know, soap opera. Yes, that's what has been our education. We are looking all in the wrong direction for satisfaction, isn't it? We have run counselors, uh, 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 trained counselors for uh, satisfaction so that we may be able to form good marriages, all in the wrong direction. And that's why there are a huge number of problems. Let me show you something in marriage that you need to understand before we go to principle number three. The Bible says, and this is vital, in chapter five of the book of Ephesians, and you're like, Zarek, you've read that quite a number of times. Why should you insist in Ephesians chapter number five? Listen, young man, or you is married, and God will convict you about the truth in his word, because his word is life, his word is spirit, his word is converted. The Bible says in chapter number five, I'm reading for you from verses number 20, and it says in verses number 21, Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. How many people are to submit themselves? One to another. Let's read the Bible right now. By the way, submission, you can, you can, dis, you can choose to read your Bible in an imbalanced way. And you'll be messed up. Submission is something that must be done by both parties. You're like, no, that's not what the Bible is saying. Yes. Submit yourself to one another in the fear of Lord. Then it now says, for specific wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. How? Just the same way you submit yourself to the Lord. That is how you're going to submit yourself to your husband. So the question is, have you submitted your life to the Lord? All right? So just us. For the Bible says, 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on others in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses, how? As we forgive those who trespass against us. You got that, right? Yes, so that's also saying, submit yourself, O oh wives, to your husbands. How? As you submit yourselves to the Lord. So that means you can never submit to your husband if you've never known submission to the Lord. Is that now clear? So submission to the Lord is prior. That's why we read yesterday, chapter 23, verse 26 of the book of Proverbs. My son, give me your what? Your heart, and then your eyes will follow my ways. So the first thing God asked us of yesterday is give me your heart. And now God is saying, submit yourself to your husband, us to the Lord. So submission to the Lord is the first and the foremost and the most important thing. The Bible does not end there. It continues to say in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now listen, careful husband. Listen, careful young man, all right? So I speak to you just a little bit. Uh, and women, you might be happy for this now. You might be happy for this. And why am I saying you're gonna be happy for this? Listen to this. Man, this is going to be hard for you. The Bible says, husbands are the head of the church. Or rather, Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. All right, so who is the head of the church? Christ. And is the head, the savior of the world, of the body, right? Christ. But we are told, therefore, verse 24, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, are you going to learn what it means submission if in yourself or in your churches, you have never taught submission to Christ? Certainly not. So then the Bible says in verse 25, husbands, now, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church, and the Bible does not stop there. Finish it with me. And gave himself for it. What do you call that? That sacrifice. But let me give you it a new expression. That is what is called eternal risk. Now let me ask you, how many men can make eternal risk? for their wives. Hello? Not a rhetorical question. How many men can make a rhetorical, uh, 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 what do you call it? Eternal risk for their wives. How deep did Jesus Christ go to express his love for the church? My Bible tells me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's just how deep it was. Abraham so loved God that he gave his only begotten son. He risked eternally losing a dear loved one for the love he had for God. And the father, for the love he had for us, risked losing Christ forever, if you didn't know about that. And Jesus risked a total separation from the Father and experiencing eternal death. So the Bible says, husbands, love your wife. Let me ask you a question that a friend once asked. If there was only one space left in heaven and you are told to choose between yourself and your wife, what would you do? No, that is not going to happen. I'm just joking your mind. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Are you like, okay, am I going to go? Or who is going to go in? Okay, you can both go in, in Jesus Christ's name. But what I'm trying to say is, that is just how close I can express eternal risk for the sake of your wife. And yet many people enter into marriage not knowing that responsibility. They don't know that, that responsibility. They don't know that responsibility. And 
we're just about to see what happens there. Okay. But then the Bible says, why is this happening? It says in verse 26, that it might sanctify and cleanse it to the washing of water by the word. Verse 26, 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and blemish. Now, did Christ win the church by coercion or by force? How did Christ win the church? Let me speak to you. If you have an unbelieving wife, are you to force your wife to believe? Are to you to use the road? Are you to use threats? Are you to use any of this thing? Christ used love. And love begets love. For before we loved God, God first loved us. And that's why today, if I love God, it's not because of coercion, it's not because of gifts, all right? It's not because of any of these things, all right? It's because God first loved me, all right? You cannot expect love, my brother, if you do not have love in your heart. You understand what I'm talking about? There is nothing you can expect which you yourself does not have. We say that our prayer must change. And how must it change? It's not about where is the lady. It's about am I the man? You understand? Am I the man? Then God will show us who that woman is. Isn't it? So that's, that's vitally important. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, welcome, uh, Gashita. So uh, it continues. And I, I would want to go to uh, the principles of marriage and... Um, Allow me to share. Um, yeah, that should be it. Now, uh, I'm trying to get this stuff done. So, um, we're talking about seeking counsel as the third step. Now, remind me, the first step was ideally, is God calling me, isn't it? Now, those who are not there, you can still write. The first step. The first step is, is God calling me? Now we realize the spirit of prophecy was very clear when it said, if you are in the habit of praying how many times? Then you should double your prayer to four times when? When you're contemplating. Thank you. And we were able to look at that statement with some magnifying glass. And we asked ourselves, when are we said to be contemplating? Are we contemplating when already we have already spotted the lady and already taken the motions of the lady? When do you begin the prayer? I know many relationships where people begin to read Adventist home when they already have the lady in box. Isn't it? Say, see to some Adventist home. Yata tu nafasa hii tukue na prayer na fasting unaona sasa si tuendelee na kufast si ndio yeah you see you are not contemplating all right you have actually chosen the woman and you are not following the counsel you understand what I'm talking about now so when you are contemplating marriage when you feel that right now i think right i need to be having a wife to live with me you begin praying, the first thing. And in that prayer is asking the question, is it time, is God calling me? That's First Corinthians 7 verse 17. Is God calling me into marriage? For we realize not all are called into marriage, all right? At a particular time. And we realize that's dealing with the time. Then the second question was, well, Am I prepared for marriage? All right? Am I prepared for marriage? What was this asking? What was this answering? This is supposed to be ideally answering, am I prepared to, for marriage? Am I physically fit to be married? All right? Am I physically done what? Fit. All right. Why do you think, um, can a child 
of 14 years come and tell you that God has impressed in my heart that I should be married. 14 years. Hello, Mama Zipora. Your daughter comes and tells you, I've been praying about it. The Lord is impressing in my mind. The Lord is leading. That I should be done what? And then you say, now, if the Lord is leading, who am I? Isn't it? Now, you need to understand she's not physically prepared to be married. Am I prepared to be married? So we looked at physical preparedness. Can the body handle marriage? Okay, you are lady. The question is, if tomorrow you got pregnant, if you had a child, can you, one, take care of the child? Can you, two, bear the child? Can you, three, be able to raise the child for Christ? Okay? So we had physical preparedness. We have what is called spiritual preparedness, of which we realize in the spiritual preparedness, we are talking about a you mature Christian, mature enough, a mature Christian, who can be able to handle things rightly with maturity. We don't want childish people going into marriage, all right? We don't want to solve childish problems in marriage, okay? So I'm not told, I mean, I mean, I'm going to leave this place and go back to my father because, uh, 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 because my husband left his socks at the door. All right? A little bit childish, isn't it? Yeah. If you go back home in some cultures, they would not actually pray for you. They might good, do good enough and resort. I said some culture, resort to other form of discipline. So that's what I'm saying. Are you spiritually, physically one prepared? Can you run your own house, all right? We don't want to come into your house and we find things messed up. Dear sister, you getting me? And then you want to tell me that you're going to take care of my house? It's going to be clean? When your clothes are not clean? You want to promise me that mine are going to be clean, that I'm going to be in a suit on Sabbath to preach? I'm not going to trust that. Okay, are you prepared? Sister White talks about neatness. Sister White talks about cleanliness. Sister White talks about, um, let me read your counsel. Ah, this, this will be interesting. Let me just get this off a little bit and um, and, and, and read you a uh, counsel. Uh, I don't know if this, this should be good. Okay, but uh, basically, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not good at technology, but if I do that, oh, I do that. Whatever. Uh, what I want to read is from, uh, I know I'll get it. Uh, look at this. In uh, this, this brother was called Rudolph. You all remember him? Let me get it from the spirit of prophecy. Uh, I've lost everything from my, including my spirit of prophecy up. Oh. Okay, anyways, Rudolph wanted to marry a, a woman. And in attempts to marry this woman, uh, Sister White wrote to Rudolph. And Sister White told Rudolph something so huge and something so special. It was nowhere. Sister White advised her and told her, I am not going to make decisions for you as to whether you will marry uh, Edith. That lady is called Edith. As to whether you will marry Edith or not, I am not going to make that decision for you. I'll leave that decision with you to make. But I'll tell you, as far as I have known Edith, one, Edith is not the wife who is going to make you happy. For one, Edith does not know what is called economy. You understand? We're talking about, are you prepared? So Edith does not know anything called economy, all right? She does not know economy. What else did Edith know? Edith did not know the physical home cause, all right? Okay? She could not be able to practice the physical home cause. And so you are in a place where your wife doesn't know how to cook. And she says, I am ready for marriage. Okay? 
we are going to be like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Okay. Uh, this is actually the thing. So uh, now, Rolf, I cannot say that it is my business to say that you shall not marry. Uh, it is my business to say that you shall not marry who? You shall not marry Edith, but I will say that I have an interest in you. What did Sister White have in Rolf? He had, she had interest. But not to make decisions. You understand what I'm talking about? Now, listen to what he says. If you want to check on it on the wall, that will be great still. But uh, this is what he says. He says, now, uh, 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 now, Rolf, I cannot say that it is my business to say that you shall not marry Edith Van. I will say that I have an interest in you. Here are the things which should be considered. Then she puts a column. Here are the things that should be considered. And I make a column. Sasa sikiza. The things that should be considered. Uh, she says one of the things is, will the one you marry bring happiness to your home? Amen. Is Edith an economist? All right. How many of you look at those things? How many of you look at those things? Borani, reform. Borani, Bora Nakula, Beck. Bora, Mwele Iko Sao. Bora, Nguo Imefika Chini. See you. Is she an economist, all right? And then the Bible says, all right, the spirit of prophecy, or will she, if married, not only use up all her own earnings, but all yours to gratify a vanity, a love of appearance, all right? You know, women, let me talk to you a little bit, sisters. When you are going, you know, a uh, man, let me tell you, when your wife goes to the market, you give your wife some money, or you give your girlfriend some money, and all she thinks about it, this, 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 doesn't think about necessary things. You know, when a woman goes to the market, she has a thousand, but she's gonna see something you're not seeing, all right? She's gonna bring back something with a little money and you're going to look like, this is a wife, all right? She has been able to see that we didn't have this and we didn't have this. There is no time that you're gonna say, or at least a few times you're gonna say, now let's get some, some table mat. But the wife's gonna come with some table mats, all right? But now, if you come to a point where uh, your wife just seated there, the tables are just looking like that, is waiting for the day when you have a meeting for buying a table mat. All right? Or a kitamba. You're waiting for a minute so that you go and get money and buy. No. She's going to see them and use the little money you are giving economically. So Sister White is saying she's used up all her earnings and yours, Zimetumika Zote, to gratify what? Vanity. And then she says, a love of appearance, are her principles correct in this direction? Ellen White says, I do not think Edith knows what self-denial is. If she had the opportunity, she would find ways to spend even more means than she has done with her selfish gratifications. Uh, with her selfish gratifications have never been overcome. With us, selfish gratifications have never been overcome. And this natural self-indulgence has become part of her life. She desires an easy, pleasant time. I must speak plainly, Ellen White says. I know, Rolf, that should you marry her, you would be mated, but not what? Much. So come to our talk about courtship, what courtship solves. You would be mated, but not what I want matched and then she says there would be something wanting in what in the one you make your wife and as far as christian devotion and piety is concerned that can never grow uh, that uh, that can never grow where so great selfishness possesses the soul i write to you Rolf, just as i would write to my son there is a great and a noble work lying just before us and the path we shall act in this world depends only upon the aims and purposes of life we may be following impulse all right 
you have the qualities in you to make a useful man. But if you follow inclination, this strong current of self-will will sweep you away. Place for yourself a high standard and earnestly strive to reach it. And that is why many once good preachers have ceased from preaching. Since they got married. All right? Okay, let's, let's, let's go now to our, our other slide. Uh, I wanted to stop sharing this. And, uh, uh, yes. Now, let, let, let's look at uh, what we have here. And, uh, okay. So seeking counsel, number three. We've talked about, number one, is God calling you? Number two, are you prepared? Now, when you have answered those two questions, then now you go to the third one, is seeking counsel. Now, we are going to have two parts of seeking counsel. Now, this is not the seeking counsel where you go to the partner's home, all right? This is where you seek counsel from your parents in regard to marriage in general, all right? You don't have a partner. You are simply talking to your parents and knowing what constitutes a successful marriage. You are talking to your elders. You are talking to your pastor. You are talking to the spiritual leaders. And we are going to find out which people should we seek counsel from, all right? Are you going to seek counsel from anyone? And this point is going to answer a lot of questions. Who are going to be our, today we call them best men or best women, best women or best ladies, whatever you call them. Who are they going to be, all right? Because if my best man can beat the wife, do you think he will tell me it is wrong if I beat my wife? Can my wife report to them if I mishandle her? Ah, all right, all right, let's talk about that. Can they? No. So if your counselors have a wrong foundation in marriage, then it means that your marriage is in trouble. Because when you have problems in your marriage, then they are going to advise you to do what they are doing in their marriage. So you see that? So you are not just going to pray for the woman. You are going to pray to find the right word. Those whose marriages have been proved beyond reasonable doubt to have stood the storm and tide of time. Amen? Amen. Is, that, is that a little bit heavy for us now? Where are we going to find such marriages, isn't it? You are going to see them in the church. A marriage that is working will be seen. Everyone knows they are all done doing what? They are working. Now, seeking counsel, that's very important. Now, look at this. Where no counsel is, the people do what? Now, you were not in class yesterday. We said we have to have to supply so that it makes some sense. Where there is no counsel, young people fall in, in love. Only Sammy was in class. Where there is no counsel, people fall in love. All right, let's get it the right way. Where there is counsel, people rise to love. Amen? So that's how we need to put it. Where there is no cancel, people fall in love. When you fall in love, you know how to rescue a person who has fallen, fallen into a ditch? The fall of it is great. Praise the Lord. That's good. But rescuing a person who has fallen in a ditch is very difficult. And it's risky. You are the one who might do what? Fall. All right? So those who have fallen in love are difficult to raise. That is why Nyla and White will say their reason will be dwarfed. Common sense will be gone. They will not hear any cancer. I told you of a, a young man who went to an aunt and the aunt was a big one to say, all right, all right, I, I think this is it says, my share mutu unatakia ni. The young man told the aunt. It didn't take three or four years, he was back. Say, I think you're telling me the truth. I can't live with that woman. You understand that? So what happened? What changed? That's what you're asking yourself. We realized something huge changed. And what changed is 
when they were uttering those words, they didn't consider that they were uttering those words because of emotional collapse. And once there is emotions, reason ceases. You see that? Let me explain to you. Because you people say that you love psychology and you love what happens is when the higher powers are taking control, the lower powers are suppressed. When the lower powers or lower passions have taken hold, their powers are suppressed. You understand how it shifts now? The moment there are motions, cancels cannot, because cancels, they come from the frontal lobe. That is where there is judgment, there is reason, there is making decisions. That is where the impression of the Holy Spirit is experienced, all right? But there is something here, uh, you call it the, um, the, uh, uh, the hind section of the brain, all right? Hind section of the world. That is where actually we are going to have, I think, um, I'm not sure about that, but I remember from my medical missionary class. That's where we are going to have emotional, hormonal controls, all those things, all right? When actually they are agitated, Ellen White says you become animalic. So what happens if your mother corrects you? You can beat her. You understand? Mimi ndiyo nitakana ye, sindiyo? Inya mutakana ye, munisaidia tu kumpenda. Isn't it? Nisha mpenda, isn't it? Is that really love? That's not true love. So because seeking cancer, so where there is no cancer, the people fall. Okay, without cancer, purposes are disappointed. But in a multitude of cancer, in a, but, but in, in a multitude of cancerous, they are done what? They are established, all right? Every purpose is established by cancer and with good advice, make war. Okay, cancer in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it what? Out. And that's what happens. Now, when Samson went down to Timna in the book of uh, Judges chapter 14, what did Samson do? He saw a woman and the woman pleased Samson. And my Bible tells me that Samson came to the parents and says, I have found a woman of the land of the Philistines. Go get me that woman. And Manoah and the wife said to Samson, listen, is there no woman of the children of Israel? And then Samson did not heed that counsel and said to the parents that she pleaseth me. Get her for me. All right? And what happened in the life of Samson? We know all the bad story. We know all the bad story. He entered a second marriage. How good was the second marriage? A man who was now born to serve God. Do you know what he was now doing? He was now quoting an, a harlot. The first wife had died, you remember? And now she was with Delilah. He was born to rescue the people of God. He was now sleeping in the laps of a woman who later destroyed his life by cutting his hair. And then he was now serving in the temple of Dagon. In the temple of Dagon without eyes. You understand what I'm talking about now? Without eyes because he failed to listen to counsel. And yesterday I said the weakest man on earth is not the man with few muscles like a rib, without eight pack, and without biceps and triceps that are as huge as you want them to be. And without all those things are living, the weakest man is the man who cannot control their emotions. They cannot control themselves. That's the weakest man. The strongest man in this world is the man that can put his body under subjection through the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, Samson failed there. And when he failed there, we know that he failed in his work. And do you know that many families of elders have failed? Many families of church leaders have failed? Many families of young people have failed? And Brother Sam was talking about it, say it can always cause you committing suicide. But I am thankful because the Bible says my grace is sufficient for you. All right? There is no cancer. Where Samson refused counsel, he fell, isn't it? So that's, that's true. Number three, let's continue. All right. 
Look at this. Meekness and lowliness of heart will lead men to desire the counsel at every word, every step, right? Meekness and lowliness of heart. What helps people to seek counsel? Meekness, all right? Like in you, Kijisi, Akomba, Umejoy, Akutosha. Will you seek counsel, my brother? Will you seek counsel if you know? You can seek counsel. And so, do you know what, something about meekness? We are told that Christ was a meek man. But do you know another person who was called meek in the Bible? Moses. Moses, that's true. Moses was a very meek person. And so, we realize that because of his meekness, he sought counsels from God. He was ever asking God what to do in a crowd. In a crisis, he led a very rebellious people, but yet because of his meekness, he learned to surrender and ask, all right? If self-ego and everything does not go down there, you can never ask for cancer, all right? So cancer and meekness. So many youths, meekness, all right? Meekness, 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 meekness. That will help you, all right? <clears throat> okay, let's continue there. <clears throat> If there is any subject that should be considered with calm reason and impassioned judgment, it is the subject of marriage. If ever the Bible is needed as a word, a counselor. Now, the Bible is our counselor. The Bible instills in us the principles that God would want us to walk in. Now, the Bible must not mention everything in a literal sense, all right? But the Bible will give the key principles that are to guide. For example, the Bible will not tell you that you need an economical woman. But the principles will say that Jesus was an economist because Jesus, when he gave the 5,000 loaves of bread, no, 5,000 people are the ones who are eating the loaves of bread. Yes, I don't want to be like the man who said that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Solomon who, who, who beat God. I, I want to be right, you know, theologically. It's 5,000 people being fed by how many loaves of bread? No, no, no. Yes, exactly. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is before taking a step that binds a person together for life. So let's ask ourselves a question. See, okay, we have to be practical, amen? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you people a question. When are we to begin seeking cancer? When? Oh, you don't know. You are still contemplating. <laughs> when are you to begin seeking cancer? Many of us begin seeking cancer when they already plan to, when they are in engagement, number six. See you. Number six. When you end up with See number six. Ugaribu kulipa dawari, sindio? Sindio unaena? Utafuta cancer. So where is cancer? Ana tumeguza kwa chip kwenye. Bye. And already we are in canceling stage. So cancer comes way before courtship begins even, before we have actually engagement. You don't seek for counsel when already, what will the counsel help you with? So you see why it's easy to reject the counsel? Because the counsel comes way when already decisions have been done what? Have been made. I've already chosen the lady. So what does the counsel help me with? The counsel can only help me now to live. It's not about the woman. Don't talk about the what? Don't talk about the man. That, that is closed. Those both sides are closed. You just talk about how this man a, can unite with this man be already we have made the what decisions look at this now she says the underhand way in which courtships and marriages are carried on in this on is the cause of great amount of misery the full extent of which is known only to god why is it only known to god because which we would not share with family it's only god who knows isn't it on this rock, thousands have made a shipwreck of their souls. 
All right, let's continue reading. If there is any subject that should be considered with calm reason, and the, uh, I've read that before. Okay, professor Christians, whose lives are marked with integrity and who seem sensible upon every other subject, make a fearful mistake where? Who are these people who are making a fearful mistake? Professed Christians, as we are told, and who seem sensible upon every other word. Hello? Are we talking to, am I talking to someone? Who make what? Who seems sensible upon every other word? If it is doctrine, we are right, isn't it? And then he says, make fearful mistakes where? Here, this is the thing. This is what he's eating it. This thing is not in the churches. I was in the general conference and when you try to get youth straight, thinking straight, that discussion will be shifted before you knew it was being shifted. The, when, when did you hear about these things being taught in our churches? So are we to blame our youth for making mistakes? All right, let me ask you, in the movements that are coming up, when last did you hear about these seminars? Tell me about this present truth movement. Do they talk about families? Do they tell youths how they should behave? Do they talk about all these things? If you talk about it, you are almost going to be kicked out. All right? I think that's why Ellen White says we, uh, time comes that we talk about some things when we are melting away morally. You understand that? We are melting away morally. Huh? I was hearing a case where a, a marriage which was contracted four months had broken. All right? All right? Oh, now I'm saying, Zarok, don't be too hard. Yes. God has called us to do what? To warn, right? Four months. It had done what? Broken. What do you think happened? There was wrong courtship. I don't care what reason the brother gives. It only means he didn't take time. He didn't see cancer. For example, if you come and tell me ABC was like this, then I'll know that you should have known that the other time. It doesn't profit me or you knowing it right now, isn't it? That information was supposed to have been known yesterday. For example, my sister, God for me. But if you get married to me, you should have known that yesterday that I'm the husband to do it. So you knowing it today means that your foundation of that courtship was all false. You understand? Because if it was right, you ought to have done what? Known that yesterday. Okay, let's continue. They say they manifest a set determined will that reason cannot change. They become so fascinated with human feelings and impulses that they have no desire to cite the Bible and come into a close relationship with what? With God. Okay, if there was a, a subject that needed to be viewed with every standpoint, it is this the aid of the experience, the aid of the experience of who? And a calm, careful way of the matter on both sides is positively essential. How many sides? It must be weighed from both sides to be balanced. It is a positive, very positive and very essential. It is a subject that is treated altogether too lightly by a great majority of what? Of people. And they say it doesn't matter. It's not a big issue. It's not a big deal. But it is one little uh, it's one little lover that spoils the meat, all right? It's not the big mistakes that break marriages. It's the little things that lead to divorce, all right? It's those little things. <clears throat> you see that man? You know why he's stepping? Does he know? Because his eyes are closed. If you try to tell him, hey, yeah, 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 man, man, man you, you're going to fall, can you see? He is in a suit leading to a wedding, all right? <laughs> and that guy, he can never be corrected because that guy is blind. Let me say, how many stars can a blind man see at night? Zero. Zero. If you convince the man that there are stars, can he believe you? 
it, it, it needs to get the skills of wizard. I mean, amazing. I thought it was very dark, but look, beautiful sky. So this is what's happening. This man is handling into the courtship leading to marriage. And this guy is blind and he's stepping right into uh, the cliff. And that's not, I wish I could make the use to see and feel the danger, right? Especially the danger of making an happy world. Marriage is something that will influence and affect your life both in this world and in the world to do what? To come. A sincere Christian will not advance his plans in this direction without the knowledge of God, uh, that God approves his course. He will not want to choose for what? But he will feel that God must do what? We are not to please ourselves for Christ did not please what? So Adam had God choosing for him. Amen. Isaac had God choosing for him. How does God choose for him? Even Abraham did not know the woman. He sent Elias. Elias prayed. And then we were able to see the beautiful experience. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighted in his way. All right. I would, not, uh, I would not be understood to mean that anyone is to marry one whom he does not do what? Love. This would be what? Sin. You must love someone who, uh, marry someone who you love. But fancy and the emotional nature must not be allowed to lead into ruin. God requires the whole art, the supreme word, affection. All right? So while they are to love and honor thy parents, they are also to respect the judgment of men or what? Of experience with whom they are connected in the men of what? Whom they are connected within the which experience? Successful. Successful marriage. And let me tell you one thing. Who is an unbeliever? We need, we need to define that a little bit better. The truth of the day, that looks better. From the Bible. Uh, basically, it's that. It's that. But if you find anyone, he could be a Christian. He could be a Seventh-day Adventist. But he does not believe as you believe. If you have studied the Bible, that person to you is an unbeliever. So you can you yoke a donkey with an ox and then go to the farm and dig. Yes, in this testimony, Pauline, your testimony uh, defines an unbeliever is one who has not accepted the truth for this time. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Can you yoke a donkey with an unbeliever? And that's why our sister was saying, if you remember that game where they were tying the legs of guys together and then you are struggling to find your way as you're moving ahead. Suppose this other guy says, I'm not going in front. What happens? <laughs> We're all stuck. That's, that's really funny. Okay, let's continue. Let's continue from uh, where we, we were. All right, look at this, friends. Uh, men of experience judgment. All right. Um, uh, this marriage. I want you to see what happens here. Vital factors in the choice. Great care should be taken by Christian youths in the formation of friendships and in choice of companions. Take it lest what you now think to be pure gold turns out to be base what? Metals. You need to think about that. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sin. Keep thyself what? I have found few faithful pastors who have followed this principle. Amen? Few pastors who will say no. Very few pastors. Who will say, I remember wedding in Nairobi, they had even put on suits. And the pastor said no. All right? He said, no, it's not happening. A lot of shit. On the wedding day, those guys went to a Sunday church and they did the wedding there. The pastor understood the principle lay hands suddenly on no man. Who is this being spoken to? 
a young man. Who is speaking to him? An old preacher, Paul. And by that sanctioning that God has given, he's saying, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sin. Question, what does that verse mean? If any person, counselor, if any church leader lay their hand suddenly on any man and he knows it, they bear the sins in that marriage. Uh huh. All right. So that means if I baptize you, I should take the responsibility of doing what? Of following you to see that you're established in your Christian experience. See you. So what if I get you married, I take the responsibility of following daily to see that you are growing in what? In Christ, all right? I take the responsibility. Okay, let's continue. I don't want to read everything. Uh, you can be able, um, I want to talk about these things with some of them we talked about. Uh, I want to look at this lastly because of time and uh, yeah, in just like 20 minutes. So if you look at the first part, seeking counsels from our parents, all right? You should go and discuss this from your parents, from your church leaders. They know you, isn't it? From your past, they know you, they understand you and they can tell you, no, uh, Brother Zanok, you want to get married, but I'm thinking there is something you need to work on. You need to pray about your temperament. You need to pray about your impatience, all right? Before you do this, they, they begin to show you a true character, isn't it? So you pray about these things because you say, am I the man? Before you look for the right woman. And the woman is saying, am I the woman? Before you look for the right man. So when the pastor or the elder or whoever is admonishing and counseling you, you are actually seeing your, your, your faults and, and, and every other age that is not right. And you ensure that you pray about it and ask God, this character is not like Jesus Christ's character. Please, God, before I put any person to be attached to me so that I mess their lives and my life, I want you to get this thing out of me. I want to be like Jesus first. So when you're praying like that, then the other lady is also praying like that. Angels who take the prayers of people like hearing what you're praying about, character perfection, character perfection. And then angels bind these two souls together because they've already first seen themselves in the mirror of God's word before they see other people in the mirror. You understand what I'm saying about? So counsel from parents will help you to see one, you, all right? Then it will help you to understand the things in marriage in an open way. You want to just look at marriage in the one side, right? Because when we get into marriage, what do you think about? Hey, how will our wedding be, right? Okay. Now I would imagine when we just wedded and then we're just walking down and everyone's looking at us and we're taking photos and he, uh, imagining they're saying we are in a sleek car and being driven around the Prado and we're taking photo session. Wow, that's gonna be nice. Then we are going to, to the beach. It's just spending time and spending, you know, you are not thinking about when I'm in the house cooking as a wife. When the child is crying and the clothes are dirty outside and all this, is anyone thinking about that? So when you are being canceled, all these things are being looked at in a balanced way. You don't just paint or build castles of what marriage is like. You know, many marriages don't go beyond the day of wedding. You understand what I'm talking about? It is all that they are planning, all right? They are not planning about the things that we talked about, how it will be like. And this is what a balanced counselor is going to talk to you about, all right? You know, I understand what I'm talking about. So you don't just see that, and then you are surprised after the honeymoon that now we have to begin real life. So what do you mean? Yeah, you know, they were cooking for us in a hotel. Please now, go and light fire and cook. We, ca we, can, we can sleep up to nine. But there is no chef. <laughs> what do you mean, hon? He said, yes, that's now honeymoon is over. Now it's practical. 
And they say, I didn't get used to this. And have, uh, an elder was telling me, you know, I found it very rough with my wife because my wife, she would light the gas on in the, the stove and then she'd go to, to the market to buy vegetables. <laughs> the stove is just blazing and blazing and blazing. And, and, and she's in the market trying to buy vegetables, come wash them. Uh, the kerosene is on. They are going to buy another kerosene. She begins doing this. Now he had to begin teaching her, honey, you know, this one, you turn it off and then you cut, you do all these things. When everything is ready, you put it on and then you put your sufria here and you begin doing what? You begin cooking. All right? Person was not prepared for real life. All right. Seek counsel with the parents of one whom you are deciding to court. Now, we are almost in courtship, amen? Actually, it's not fun. But now, look at it. You've sought counsel from your parents, from your church members in a guy. Now, you are deciding to court someone you prayed about it. And we saw it in the story of Isaac. Now, when Eliezer has gone, and Eliezer, where is Eliezer now? Eliezer is next to the well. Eliezer does what? Prays, all right? So we saw the part of prayer. Then when he prays, he says, the one who will come and feed my word, myself with water and my comments. All right? Now, it was not just himself. You know, you are just looking at the woman who will serve you. All right? I am going to be very careful if Mimi and the woman let her key to, all right? You are my, you want, you are my girlfriend. You brought me something and bypassed all these people. I'm going to be very careful with you, right? So if you're only serving me and you're overlooking other guys, you're not even yet married, that means if strangers come into my house, they're in trouble. Because you can prepare me a good food and neglect the guests. You understand what I'm saying? So Eliezer is testing something. Can she feed me and feed the comments? Are you getting it? Or is she going to complain and say, I thought I was helping you? Now you are taking advantage of me. You want me to supply all these camels, 10 camels, drinking gallons of water. Did Rebecca complain? Down in the water, up. One bucket. Down to the, up. Down to, you know, Eliezer is just timing. He's just looking, will she utter words of complaint? Well, she's beginning to see industrious woman, uh, very humble, does not complain. This is the wife I want for my master, sir. This is the one I was looking for. And Eliezer just says, did you think Eliezer said, uh, can we go so that you get married to um, Isaac? No, 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 he says, whose daughter are you? Amen? Amen. Where do you come? You want to marry a lady, you don't know where the lady comes from. You want to know this. When did you know where your, your, your girlfriend comes from? Some people even, even, even did know until there was a funeral. What? Say, oh, where is your home? I, I'm here, I'm, I'm a bit lost. I'm, I'm not sure which direction we should take. I mean, excuse me. You are parents, you don't know where their homes are? Your wife, you don't know where the home is? Now, look, this was so interesting. He said, whose daughter? Where do you come from? Which people do you come from? Then he says, let me go and see your what? Your parents. Amen? Mm -hmm. He didn't say, let me go to Isaac. Call Isaac that I've got a wife. No. He went to the, to the parents. And you know, there are things that Eliezer gave out to that woman to appreciate. You know that there are some men who are very mean. We talk about it in courtship. And even they're very mean, all right? They can't spend a dime, all right? Say, let's just walk on food up to road. Sure. All right? 
So that's what we are talking about. We find that it was very balanced in everything. It was not on the excess. It was not on this side and all this side. This is so beautiful for me. He says, let me go and see your pa, your parents. And he goes to the parents on the other side. Rebecca said, and that night Rebecca said all that he mentioned with that guy to his mother. What, what was going on? Rebecca was now seeking to have the mother know the whole story so that if it's all wrong, the mother can warn her. Because why the mother? Because ladies, you need to have your mothers as your close confidence. One, the most important. And then men, you must share a lot of things with your father, of course, all your parents, but that's how God has made. And so she shared everything. When you meet a man on the road and you continue to court and end into relationship with this person and be known to your parents, you are a thief, all right? So you should go to the parents. Someone says, no, 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 at what time do you go to the parents? That's what my sister was asking, praise the Lord. At what time do you go to the parents? When Elias went to the parents. At what time do you seek personal cancer? When Rebecca went to the cancer. Rebecca went and sought for counsel by sharing all this with the what? With the mother. And then after that, they didn't doubt. And let me tell you, the reason why they, they knew about Abraham, you know, they had heard the story of Abraham. His story was published everywhere. They were relatives in a way, all right? So they knew something about it. And you know what happens? That is why the parents here did a trip the other side because who has commanded his family after god so when they hear that is so and so i mean that you're going to be married to the son of elder so and so i know he's a godly man you understand and that's why now even before you get your parents go and see the parents of that woman you understand that so, oh, that is too much i said it's gonna be too much it's going to require everything of you, all right? Say, how do you start? Well, if you don't know how to start, it means you're not ready to marry that woman, all right? It will all start by saying that you love God and respect God, and that's why you do not feel that you can tap into the feelings of this lady without informing the parents. Let me tell you, the parents are going to do what? I'm going to respect you. So you are humble thieves, amen? Humble thieves. Thou shalt not steal is written in the finger of God. This has been read over and over again. Uh, and says, yet how much and stealing of affection is practiced and excused? And a hand what? Stealing of affection. Huh? Ask questions, deceptive practices. Uh, we've talked about this. For Sammy, I talked about this. I don't want to to get into this. Let me talk about this. If you are blessed with God-fearing what? Right. Seek counsels of them. All right? But I will say that there are people who have written me messages, names. Some of them say, brother, I don't think I can be able to talk to my parents because they are not godly. I say that should not be the case. And I said it yesterday, and I'll say it again. Some may say you are removing yourself from the platform of truth. But listen, your parents might not believe as you believe, but there are some societal principles where they are right. Are you getting it? There's some societal principles where your parents are right. So you should talk to them and use the principles, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So you are not going to simply brush out your parents and say, I'm not gonna give them money because they eat flesh. You understand? I'm not going to support them. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be there on this. No, that's not it. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good, right? So hear what your parents are telling you. If you are a good child, share it with other spiritual leaders, men of experience, whom you are seeing that their marriages are stable, they are loving, and all these things. And you can say, hallelujah. I'm going to follow this from my mom, but this one I'm, I'm, I'm sadly not going to do what? Well. I'm sadly not going to follow it. And you will respectfully explain to them why you don't feel like this one you can be able to do. And why you feel like the other one you can be able to do. And I can, of course, cite a number of examples 
where parents can give you a good uh, advice, right? Where parents can rightly counsel you on what to do and what not to do, all right? Yeah, parents are good. They say, hey, you see, the sister is coming here with, she does not know how to cook. Is that a wrong counsel? Will you reject that counsel because your parents are not Christians? If she cannot know how to cook, then most probably you are going to be in trouble in your marriage. Should parents you ask select a companion without regard to the minds uh, or feelings of the son or daughter? Our brother answered this already. This was his question. Why? This young man says, do you think a father or a mother ought to pick out a companion for me without regard to my mind or feelings? The problem, and I'll explain this quote, the problem here you need to understand. You need to understand what is going on here. Now, what happened between Isaac and Eliezer is Isaac was the best servant of Eliezer was the uh, best servant of Abraham. And Abraham had a family of about a thousand people. There were families with fathers and mothers who were under his care. Have you read that in part of his prophets? And he had directed this family so they knew that everyone in this family was brought up straight. Ele alejua, if I get this man for this woman, there is not going to be a problem. And we talked about providence the other time. But now here is a question where now this man is asking, can a mother or a father pick out a companion for me without regard to my mental feeling? I put the question to you as it should be. Should a son or a daughter select a companion without first consulting the parents? That's not the right question, isn't it? When such a step must materially affect the happiness of their parents if they have any affection for their children, right? If you have a woman who does not think about the well-doing of your parents, all right? She just wants you to fill your house with all the luxurious things. Your mother is suffering. Hello, your parents are suffering. They don't care about it. They all want you to be, I mean, that flashy house, all those things. You don't care about your parents. You don't care about all these things. She can, man, we want a woman, when you take her home, she'll even think that your mother doesn't have a dress and do your mother dress, and I think your mother can say, what a wonderful woman, all right? You just went with her home and she saw a problem, right? You went with her and your mother old, just trying to get them washing their hand, should have stood and say, mommy, let me help you, all right? Yeah, you know, women, <laughs> mothers are very, very careful, you know, they want to test. Anakuja na kumwagia maji, ayangalia msichana na katu, they should be already starting arranging the table, isn't it? Doing this, say, oh, wow, <laughs> this is a woman already. I've seen what I want. One day, parents can see what you cannot see when standing and see it while they're sitting down. You, you have never seen that before. A parent has tested and found out some irresponsibility. Okay? All right. So I think I don't need to be labor on this because other speakers have labored on this. But I want you to understand that the problem that we are having is the problem whereby we've had too much speaking than doing. Amen. We need to begin doing. Blessed is the man that heareth these things and doeth them. Amen. Amen. As whatever God wants. Let's pray. You can just. Father in heaven, you're so thankful. You've gathered us to learn, Lord, the way of righteousness. We have made mistakes in the past. We can't even get the strength, Lord, to rectify them of our own strength. But you can make all things new. So, Lord, today, renew, Lord, a new heart within us. And we are praying, Lord, that you may fill us with our eternal spirit, sanctify us, and make our homes new again. The young youths who have made mistakes, help them. Those who are contemplating, direct them. Build us all together, Lord, that we may be born by cords of love that can never be broken. Till we meet in the glorious sea, glass, sea of glass, and see one another, Lord, with the crowns 
of how their marriages were able to bring more to the truth. Here's our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, all right. Uh, we'll stop at the point and I think I'll leave you more time.